Now again, set theory comes into play here. Fish would be one set. Man would be an entirely different set. There are too many changes that would have to occur in the fish set to result in the man set for anything of the fish set to even survive. In other words, the number of gene changes that would have to take place, the things that were changing from fish would die before ceasing to be fish. They could change color, they can change shape, the fins can be, you know, differently shaped, larger, smaller, but they couldn't turn into hands no matter how long you waited. They couldn't turn into feet no matter how long you waited. The breathing through the gills couldn't become, you know, solely air, air breathing no matter how long you waited, no matter how much time. There are just too many changes that have to occur. So the set of attributes for fish can combine in a lot of ways, but they would still be fish. Genetically, because the genes can't survive a tr that, kind, that much transition over any period of time. Now, the Darwinians try to contend that, well, see, they're intermediary stages. Yeah, but at some point, the fish set has to stop being fish. All right, and there's no evidence that that actually occurs. The Darwinians then point to what seem to be like amphibious creatures and say, well, these came from the fish set. Uh, not necessarily. If the amphibious group, let's say, was always there, right alongside the fish, then it's just progressive hybridization of the amphibious nature. And similarly, to lose the amphibious nature. See, because, you, you know, mammals, land animals, are land animals. They are not all amphibious. The ones that are land animals and are not amphibious, there were a lot of differences there. To be able to go in the water and breathe the water, breathe it. Inhale and exhale the water. To be able to do that is a significant, requires a significantly different biological structure than either a creature that's solely living underwater, okay, or solely living on land. There's a huge difference in the whole biological structure that has to occur. It's too much. So an amphibian would remain an amphibian. Couldn't get rid of it. Okay? Couldn't get rid of one or the other. And if, the, if you say, well, yeah, they could because they're amphibian to start with, okay, show me how it gets rid of it. Where's the fossil evidence to show that that actually happened? Because you've got the same data. Look, you've got fish, you've got amphibians, and then you've got land mammals. Well, just restrict it to mammals, but you could say land animals, land anything. You can't prove from what we got that there was a progression from one to the other. It doesn't mean that there is a progression. And there's no evidence to suggest a progression. And there ought to be if there really was a progression. Because this progression, if it's occurring in small steps over a long period of time, considering how much we've got in sedimentary rock, conglomerate rock, we can age, we can date, even with all the problems in carbon dating. We can date, like from the Grand Canyon, how old those rocks are. 
you know, you can't use carbon dating, but you can use dating. You can date the rocks. We got fa fossils trapped in rocks. In fact, in the Grand Canyon in particular, a lot of the, the fossil, the, the reason why it's the Grand Canyon the way it is, is because there was so much debris from living creatures there. All right? Then with that much debris and with that much, you know, rock that takes thousands and thousands of years to compress, all right, for example, in sedimentary rock, then you should have more evidence of this progression in the interim stages, and we don't have it. So you can't say that because they're fish and they're amphibians and there's land that there was a progression from water to land. You can't say that. It would be equally, from the same evidence, it would be equally correct to say, at least equally correct if not more, that those other types of animals always existed. And of course a lot of people who call themselves evolutionists do say that. There's a whole lot of research going on in that, one of which is, I, I haven't really investigated it so much because it sounds so funny, punctuated equilibrium. All right, that's one of the ideas that's offered. Well, it's just as good an explanation as anything else, and it's got more to support it. And then the Darwinian idea of this unending progression from simple to complex which no gen genes can withstand. Sorry. Now, hopefully I've been able to explain that you got propagation, you got hybridization, you got adaptation, and you've got other evolutionary ideas that posit, you know, a sort of Noah's Ark population from which the rest of, as it were, animals or, you know, flora and fauna come. And those ideas are supported by the evidence we got. None of this is conclusive of anything. But in any event, it doesn't answer or even point in any particular direction for or against the existence of God. At all. And like I said before, and I'm going to keep on saying it because so many people just are apparently unable to read Genesis 124, God decrees an evolutionary process for animals. And the Bible never says how old the earth is or the universe or anything else. It's totally untimed before Adam's fall. There's no time given. There's no time given except for the restoration of the earth was six literal days, six 24-hour periods. Hebrew expression is, is um, absolutely literal. And anybody thinking it isn't is an idiot. Because in the Hebrew it says, and it's usually translated properly too, evening, morning, one day. Evening is divided into 12 hours Morning is the, is referring to the day, another 12 hours. It's a 24-hour literal period. It's a Hebrew idiom for a 24-hour period. It does not mean like day of the Lord, which is not necessarily one single day. It's a very different, very different, um, what do you want to call it, nomenclature in the Bible. For a figurative day versus a literal day. And you have to be very careful when you're reading the Bible, you know, whether a literal day is meant or whether it's a figurative day. Day of the Lord is a figurative, specific term that's referring back to Psalm 90, verse 4. That's where the, the term day of the Lord comes from. Isaiah started using it. It was used even before him, but Moses is the source of that quote. That expression derives directly from Psalm 90, verse 4. Day, you know, day with God is, is a thousand years. Okay, but that's not what Genesis 1, 2 and following is saying. Evening, morning, one day. 
literal 24-hour period. So anybody trying to equate the six days of the literal, you know, the restoration, not even initial creation of the earth, uh, anybody trying to, you know, uh, what do you want to call it, spin it out, they're just lying to you. Or they're stupid. Take your pick. Sorry. There are a lot of so-called gap theory people who who try to spin it like that because they're trying to reconcile the Bible to science. There's no need to reconcile it. The Bible doesn't disagree with science to start with. Science of Neo-Darwinist evolution disagrees with science itself. And that's what I've been trying to describe here. You got propagation, so that's not evolution, no matter how long it is. You got hybridization, and that's not evolution, no matter how long it is. And yeah, you got mutations, but they die out. And there's no proof that, that there's some kind of selection process where the kind of mutation it is is what's best for the organism or the phyla or anything else. Okay. Um, the gene can't support too much change before the gene dies. So the organism that would be mutating too much will die before it transmutes, which is Darwin's own term, transmutation of the species. In other words, how an ape could be something could become humanoid. That would be a transmutation. Technically speaking, you cannot talk about the evolution of man. Because if man cannot evolve and still be man. You can talk about the evolution from, you know, if you could prove it, but you can't, the evolution to man, but not the evolution of man. Man, if man evolved, he would no longer be man. He'd have to become something else. So you can't say man evolved. It, it's a very bad usage of the term in common parlance today. Well, our, our programs have evolved from... Are they still programs? Then they didn't evolve. The minute a program evolves, it's no longer a program, it's something else. If you say, well, my thinking has evolved. Well, no, it hasn't evolved. It's changed or developed, but not evolved, because if it evolved, it wouldn't be thinking anymore. It becomes something else. See, evolution was coined as, as meaning transmutation by Darwin. Transmutation. So an ape is no longer an ape, but becomes something more what you want to call humanoid. Then it's no longer an ape. It becomes something else. All right? You might be able to make an argument, and some do, and of course I was taught this in school also, that the reptiles evolved into the, a lot of the flying reptiles evolved into the modern birds of today. Well, that, that's an assertion, really. You don't know that that's true. But there's a great deal of similarity between a pterodactyl in its essential structure and my cockatiel. All right? Great similarity of structure. Of course, did the cockatiel actually have the pterodactyl or some other flying reptile as its ancestor? Not necessarily. But you see the difference where evolution would be evolution versus? If the ancestor of my cockatiel is really a pterodactyl, then you have to call that evolution because the pterodactyl stopped being a pterodactyl and became just a plain bird because a bird is not a reptile. I mean, you can get into a taxonomy issue if you want. Reptiles lay eggs, birds lay eggs. When does it stop being a reptile and start being a bird? But that is closer to a true meaning of evolution. Okay, but you can't say that for mankind. And there's no evidence to say that you can say it about anything else in the Darwinian sense of transmutation. Where a fish stops being a fish and becomes something more advanced, complex. 
Where a fruit fly stops being a fruit fly. God knows how many ex how many experiments have been run on fruit fruit flies. They are still fruit flies. No matter what you do to them. And the other thing that would be really important to understand is you can't even develop a computer model. Okay, that naturally, naturally, will turn into some kind of evolutionary model, naturally, without you tinkering with it. In other words, you posit that, uh, you know, the primordial ooze, and then you hit it with random changes. There have been a lot of experiments done on this. You hit it with random changes. Those random changes never result, no matter what you do, no matter how many iterations and how many mutations, they never result in transmutation. It breaks down, or it just doesn't go anywhere at all. So there's nothing to back up Darwinian theory in the new Darwinian, or even in the old one. There's a lot of, uh, I don't know, conjecture. We should call it the Darwinian conjecture. Evolutionary conjecture. Darwinian evolutionary conjecture, because the other theories that are also misnamed evolution, they got more, more evidence to back them up. But you can't call those other theories really evolution either. Because it's just extended hybridization. With some initial group of extremely varied population to start with. A sort of Noah's Ark concept. That's not really evolution. That's hybridization and adaptation combined, throw in a little bit of mutation here and there. You see the point? And again, even if you went through all of this stuff, and even if somehow it magically turned out that the Neo-Darwinians were right, which of course would turn math and genetics and physics upside down, Even if the Darwinian argument advanced today by Dawkins and his ilk were true, it doesn't do anything to disprove God. It doesn't do anything to prove him either. And, hello, God didn't specify in Genesis 1.24 any particular form of animal evolution. He just said, after their kinds. Well, what does that mean? Well, it can mean anything you want, including Darwin. The only reason I'm sure it doesn't include Darwin is Darwinian version of evolution doesn't work. It makes great sci-fi, which I love. And it's it would be nice if it were true. i got to tell you that. You know, I've spent so much time arguing about why it's so wrong, but I haven't told you my personal attitude about the idea. I would love it if Darwinian evolution were true. That is just so adorable, it's beyond description. I mean, you know, that all life begins with just a bunch of proteins, you know, somehow magically imbued with life and magically swimming around like little sperms and little eggs and magically combining to produce life. That would be cute. That would be fun. I really like that idea that everything does have a common ancestor. I would like it if that were true, but it can't be. And even if it were, as much as I like the elegance of it, it doesn't, well, if anything, to me, that would argue that God was doing a cute thing, making everything depend on one, see? That's why I think it's cute is that if Darwinian evolution were somehow true, then everything started with one. Well, but that's the story in the Bible. It started with one couple, Adam and the woman. You see? So there's an elegance to the idea of Darwinian evolution that's very attractive to me. But it's not mathematically or genetically possible. So, it doesn't do anything to disprove God at all. If anything, I... We kind of think it would depict God's sense of humor. You know, we're dependent on one man, Christ, for our salvation. We're dependent on one couple. This is all Romans 5.12. 
you know, the whole verse, Romans 5.12, would be depicted if Darwinian evolution were true. Wouldn't that be neat? A biological origin, therefore, would be this, you know, one set of, you know, protein that magically turned into sperm and magically turned into an egg, magically united, and magically produces all, all life after that. That's cute. And that would be the origin, supposedly, of our biological nature. That would be nice. I like that. It's kind of poetic. Okay, but it's, it's not supported by any science that we know. Sorry. Now, the other thing I need to say, and hopefully finish all this off. I'm sorry this is so long, but I want to get it all done in one go. Adam, according to the Bible, has an immaterial soul made in God's image and that's why you can hear God when he talks to you it's not audible hearing it's thought the soul is immaterial so it lives on thought hearing sight those are biological thought is not biological and they've never been able to find any proof anywhere whatsoever of thoughts being imprinted on the brain they know that thoughts connected to the brain but they can't find where the thoughts are located because thoughts aren't biological. Biological sensory input or output that's associated with thoughts, they can find where those sensory stores are located. Color, sight, smell, emotion. All those things are biological. But the thought that produced them or points to them so that when you stimulate certain parts of the brain, a person can smell something, or see a color, or remember something, which is real important when it comes to Alzheimer's patients. They're trying to do a lot of work on that, see if they can't do something. They can't find where the thoughts are. They can't find where the memories are. So that's why it's so difficult in trying to treat Alzheimer's, because they can't find the thoughts. because the thoughts aren't biological. So now think about this. The first sold person was Adam. We don't know when Adam was created. We only know when he fell. So we don't know how many thousands of years he lived before he fell. He lived who knows how long before the woman was made and who knows how long before the couple fell. We don't know how long that was. We only know that the time of his fall was recorded. The time of his fall was 4106 B.C. per the Bible. The Bible starts measuring time at that point only. I've demonstrated that time and again in my Psalm 90 playlist and in the Genesis playlist beginning at episode 8C1. So now think. If it were really true, like the picture that's on the screen, that somehow the biological part of man was developed through an evolutionary process. Because when God says he made man from the dust of the ground, that's not um, necessarily direct. It could be poetic language. Because there are a whole lot of people who will interpret it that way, Jews and Christians alike. Um, I'm not sure I would, but, you know, that the argument exists, okay, that it, making him from the dust of the ground just means it's made out of, you know, earth materials. Okay, well, organic compounds. Well, biology is organic. Duh. Okay. You don't know that whatever biology existed prior to Adam being unsold, you don't know how sophisticated it became. And that matters a great deal, and I got new insight about that just today because I had just finished mailing something, and I was driving back, and I was stopped at a stoplight, and I'm not making this up, I promise you, because this, this tends to argue for evolution, okay? There was a crow. I, I, I'm not making this up. There was a crow 
I had to stop at the stoplight. There was a crosswalk. There was a crow, you know, bird, walking on between the two white lines of the crosswalk. It looked me straight in the eye. And it started to walk, and the light changed. And it, you know, caught itself because the light changed and started to walk and I had to wait until it finished crossing the crosswalk before I could drive and turn. It waited. It, it looked at me and then started to walk. It knew the light had changed. It was going, it was, you know, it's like the light it was just about to turn green and it knew that that was happening and it scurried to get across the crosswalk because it knew the light had changed. I'm not making this up, I promise you. So just how sophisticated were ancient animals? I don't know. I taught my own bird to clap. I taught her how to see herself in the mirror and clap her wings when she saw herself. I could command her to clap and she would do so. I taught her to recognize herself, which animals aren't supposed to be able to do. I taught her by taking her in front of the mirror and telling her that that was her because she, cause she could see herself and she could see herself sitting on my shoulder and she knew who I was and she learned to do that. I've taught animals many different things that, that, you know, make it arguable just how smart they might be. We know that animals can make very sophisticated structure, whether it's the ants or beavers, you know, uh, birds. I don't remember if polar bears can do much, but there are some really sophisticated structures that certain animals can make, and they can be very smart. Okay, but being smart about being able to make structures doesn't mean they have a soul. You know, this has been an argument for centuries amongst evolutionists even. You know, do animals have self-consciousness? It's generally agreed that they don't. And I kind of hope that they don't because then they'd know how small they are. But, you know, what's self-consciousness? Does self-consciousness, having it or not having it, preclude you from being smart? Do you have to have self-consciousness in order to be smart, to be able to build sophisticated structures? Do you have to be um, self-conscious in order to be able to paint? I bet you can give painting tools to monkeys. And if you showed them how to paint first... They would know how to paint something. It wouldn't necessarily mean that they paint anything significant. But they're imitative. You see the point? I don't know what to say about the so-called hunter-gatherer phase. All I know is the Bible never depicts Adam and his progeny as hunter-gatherers. The first thing Cain, Adam's son, does is go out and build a city. That's not hunter-gatherer. Adam was literate. He had full faculty of language. Okay, the things that are said, the way he talks to God, he's very literate. Cain is very literate. Lamech in Genesis 4 is very literate. And these are supposed to be like, you know, close generations to Adam. They're all living at about the same time. Mortality back then? Oh yeah, a man could have lived a thousand years back then. I mean, you, you just talk to almost any biologist you want, and they're baffled that we die as young as we do. A lot of people say that that's due to environmental factors. Yeah, and if you spent your life hunting and fishing, or you spent your life building, instead of just lollygagging around, you might be able to live that long. And there are other explanations I can give you. But the point is that Adam had a soul. You wouldn't be able to physically tell the difference necessarily. Except that he was smarter and he lived in a different manner. 
versus the so-called hunter-gatherers, cavemen, that sort of thing. And we also don't know if those people were like devolution. Okay? I'm sorry that this took so much longer, but my point is essentially that it doesn't matter if Darwin's right. And if I went by my personal um, tastes, I wish he was right. Because it's nice and elegant. Might even give us clues as to the resolution of physics and the you know unified field theory and physics. But there's no evidence to support Darwinian evolution at all. Just a lot of wishful thinking. And in order to try to make it look like evidence supports Darwinian evolution, the schools conflate non-evolutionary propagation that is documentable with evolution and just assert that they're connected and they're not. Mere propagation of itself is not evolution. I don't, it, the timeline doesn't matter. It's just simple propagation. Okay, mutated propagation by itself is not evolution and the, the gene cannot survive that much transmutation, which is required for Darwinian evolution to be true. Hybridization is also not evolution, no matter how much time it is. Because it's still just hybridization occurring over and over and over again. But that's hybridization, not evolution. And then finally, and most importantly, adaptation is not evolution either. You can't say that because your genes adapt to your environment, that that somehow magically gets turned into transmutation, which is essential to the Darwinian idea of evolution. There's no evidence whatsoever to support that adaptation can go that far, to transmute. There's nothing in the fossil record at all to support it. All you've got is conjecture and that's really bad science. In other words, science has been religified. It was wrong for the popes of Galileo's day to, to you know, be so unbiblical and misuse the Bible and pretend that the earth was flat, which the Bible never says. All the ancient peoples knew better than that. They knew that the, the earth revolved around the sun they knew that. They used that. They couldn't have even navigated the globe without knowing that. And that, I mean, orbited the sun, and they knew that the earth revolved, rotated on its axis. Everybody in the ancient world knew that. There was no big whoop there. You couldn't, you couldn't sail your boat around the Mediterranean or anywhere else, and you could sail around the world in a couple of years. I think Thor Hydral ended up proving that, or somebody did later on in life. But, I mean, you could skirt the coast and you could travel around the world in a couple of years just in a boat. Well, you'd need to know the stars and you'd need to know how they worked and you'd need to know that the earth rotated and you'd need to know that it revolved around the sun or you would go off course. So the whole world knew this forever. And because some popes in Galileo's day, because, you know, in the dark ages we lost all of our scientific knowledge because they were suddenly reverting to this cockamamie idea that the earth was flat and that the 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 sun revolved around the earth just because they were saying that didn't make it true and it certainly wasn't in the Bible but look what they did to Galileo look how wrong that was Okay, is it any less wrong for atheists to try to assume and assert connections that aren't there in science? Look what's happening to scientific inquiry. It's become a political football. You can't advance in your career in science if you even entertain or say anything that remotely sounds like you might believe or might entertain the idea that God might exist. Unless you have a really great startling reputation prior, and then after that everybody will still avoid you. Is that fair? Why should scientific inquiry be tainted by being subverted to some political agenda, whether it's toward the God question or away from it? 
Just let them do their thing and where the chips fall, they fall. And as you can see, even if Tarwin were right, it doesn't prove anything about God. So to contend that, oh, evolution is a fact, therefore the Bible is wrong, a person saying that is downright stupid or lying or both. Peace out.